Welcome everybody. This is a webinar dedicated on uh, the ultimate website redesign guide and when it's the time for a makeover, how you can make it a success. Today is 20th of April, the, the time is 2 p.m., 2.30 p.m. local Danish time. And uh, we can start with uh, the little housekeeping uh, that we always go through. As you all know, a live uh, transcription and Zoom are already available. You can either switch them off or um, keep them as it suits you. The recording of this webinar together with uh, closed captioning and of course the slides will be provided to those of you who registered for the webinar and are unable to attend. Uh, and also like use the chat just the way you're using it at the moment to mention where you're coming from, to put your questions if you have something on the go. We'll usually take them at the end but it will be always nice to have them beforehand written. Uh, and today's speakers, I'm host and moderator. My name is Graciela Jalova. I worked as a daily, as a revenue marketing manager here at Noncido, uh, powered by Civic Plus. But um, as a marketeer, I have um, been doing a lot of website redesign projects. So I know sometimes how challenging it could be uh, to uh, fulfill such project in a time manner and also without errors. Um, next to me on the slide, but also you can see them on the camera is Christian. Maybe you can do a little intro of yourself. Definitely. Hi everyone uh, online as well. Um, so my name is Christian. I am uh, kind of the sales manager for our European markets. Um, and I think my role in this is I have assisted a lot of different organizations across Europe with how to use Monsido in, a, in kind of a redesign process. So, um, so I'll go through, through that as well, but I'm um, happy to see you all. Perfect, and I'll give a quick intro. My name is Jasmine de Guzman. I am the Director of International Marketing here at Monsito Powered by Civic Plus. And as a marketer, I would be remiss not to say that I've done quite a few different website redesigns. So looking forward to sharing some of my experiences with you today and some of what I wish I would have done and what I'll definitely be doing the next time I personally undergo a website redesign. Yeah, the, the best is to learn from your mistakes, right? Absolutely. <laughs> they stick. So um, for those of you who are not familiar so much with Monsido, Monsido is a website scanner platform. We are providing a full overview with the different dashboards of your website performance. If you have um, any type of errors um, in broken links, images missing alt text, and as I mentioned in the very beginning, our core product is around digital accessibility, where we are trying to help a lot of organizations, both from the public and the private sector, to become digitally accessible for uh, all users. And um, those are a few of our customers, many more on the map, but slides are too small to feature everyone. And today agenda. We will go through the key indicators that your website, um, that you need for your website redesign project, and also how to set the budget, the timeline, and the expectations, as well as uh, we will uh, go through those, we call them five phases, call them five steps or five essentials that uh, your website redesign project must have. And in the end, we will share a little bit of our like best practices and what you need to consider as a team and an organization when it comes to website redesign projects. And again, Q&A, fill in the chat. We'll take it at the end. And um, let's dig into it with a little pulse check. Let's find out um, what your state is at the moment, how, how many of you have actually done a website redesign project and how it was your experience. Maybe you are facing right now one and um, you are nerve wracked thinking of how it's gonna go. Uh, but many of us have did it multiple times, uh, maybe on a smaller scale, maybe on a full scale, like a full website. But we can see that some of you are preparing for it. We're crossing fingers. Uh, we are hoping that everything we're gonna share today with you are uh, gonna settle you for success. And uh, those of you who did it, but it was a painful process, we bear with you, we've been there as well. Congrats to those of you who did it as a success. As a success. And uh, I'm gonna end the poll over here and I'm just gonna share the results so you can know also uh, how the fellows uh, on the live are doing. So I think here uh, we can start diving in a little bit of 
what is a website redesign? And I think Jasmine can take over from here. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much, Graziella. And so nice to see that some of you had, have had success with the website redesign. Please share your tips and tricks in the chat because I'm going to share a little bit of my own experience, but not every website redesign is the same. I myself have done very different website redesigns so different things work. And for those of you who've done it without success, I hope you'll be able to walk away with some, some tips today um, on how to do it better next time, right? We can always improve. And for those of you who are just about to get started, you guys can do it. We're your, your number one fans and really want to encourage you. But first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about what a website redesign is and why you might need one. And so, as I mentioned, as a marketer, I've done my fair share of website redesigns. And if any of you are connected with me on LinkedIn, you'll have seen that I have done a website redesign in two weeks one time. And another time I did one that took almost a year. So there's a lot of different ways to do a website redesign and it can mean a lot of different things. So it can be anything from switching out your content management system. I personally did that in my first large website redesign which is why it took a full year. You're not only overhauling the look and feel and the content of your website when you're doing it at that scale but also often the structure or maybe you're doing a full rebrand to implement. So there's no one checklist of saying this is what it means to redesign your website it can mean a lot of different things and the scope can look incredibly different so as I mentioned the first time uh, that I did a website redesign it took nine months it was a new platform new integrations um, we redesigned or restructured our entire file structure that was going to be integrated with a website we integrated with our CRM, our customer relationship management system and our database because we needed, be, needed to be able to show our resellers on our website. So there was a lot of things and a lot of different stakeholders that went into it. We needed sales buy-in, we needed um, the executive teams, we needed our customer success people, everyone in the organization. The second time round, um, I did a website redesign. It was really only, uh, it was a much smaller website. I think it was only about 50 pages or so. And that's what we did in two weeks. And while we reused a lot of the content, it was really focused on a refreshed look and feel of the website. So yes, we redesigned the website in two weeks, um, but we reused a lot of the content. We used the same website platform, but we gave it a totally new branded look and feel. And so that just goes to show and what I wanted to give as an example there is what it means to do a website redesign can look vastly different in different organizations and setting those expectations internally within your organization is incredibly important um, for your success. And so that's probably also why some of you have had challenges because a website redesign has meant different things to different people in your organization. Awesome. If we can jump to the next slide, Graziela. Thank you. So key indica indicators that you need a redesign. As I mentioned, I've probably already talked a little bit about some of them, but for me, the whole reason you should be looking to undergo a redesign really has to do with what's not working on your website. Um, I think us as people who are responsible for websites, we have our own kind of challenges and qualms with our websites of, I really don't like the menu on our website, or I wish our forms were integrated in a different way, or I wish I'd prioritized accessibility more the first time or the user experience could be much better on some of our key pages. Um, so the reason for you to undergo a website redesign, I think is often very, very much focused on what's not currently working and how you can improve. But at the same time, you can incorporate a lot of other different elements. So um, yes, you're doing a website redesign, but you might also be thinking about, hey, I'm doing a website redesign. How do we also ensure that improved SEO is incorporated into that? Or how do we ensure an improved user experience and user flow? Um, how do we ensure that the design of the page improves conversion? Or if you're serving, um, uh, if you're a B2C company, maybe you want more consumers to convert on your page. Or if you are a comuna or a municipality, you wanna say, how can I make it easier for residents um, to engage with us and get the services they need from you online instead of coming into your offices. Um, one of the other very big and main reasons that a lot of organizations undergo website redesign is of course also outdated content. Um, your website is your main digital real estate. 
you don't own your Facebook page, you don't own um, wherever else you may be listed, but you own your website and you're fully in control of that and the content that's on there. And it's incredibly important that you use it as a professional way to reach out uh, and represent your organization, whether you are working in government or in the public sector or in the private sector. So um, if I, for example, was moved to a new commune and I went to their website and they told me that, hey, I need to register my child in school through this page. And the first thing I did was click on the link and it was a broken link. I would be incredibly disappointed. It's a very frustrating user, user experience. On the other hand, uh, if it worked right away, it would be a very positive user experience. And this is one of the reasons why a lot of people undergo a website redesign. It's to make sure that your information is accurate, to make sure that you are seen as trustworthy and that you are uh, have a good reputation in your space. Awesome. And a couple of things that I just want to highlight before, I think I talked a little, little bit about it, um, but before you do a website redesign, of course, expectation management, I, I'm starting a little bit from the bottom here, but identifying those internal stakeholders that will be impacted is incredibly important, setting the same expectation. But you as responsible for the website also need to do your homework before, and that is doing things like identifying what are your most important pages, knowing what your top 10, top 20 pages are, prioritizing those and redesigning them to be improved. Um, mapping where you think your kind of main uh, current user flows and journeys are, knowing what are the maybe top 10 purposes of people visiting your website, and then understanding what those different visitors' personas are so that you can better design uh, the user experience for them is incredibly important homework. And then communicating that with those internal stakeholders and making sure everyone's aligned, right? And then if we hop to the next line, yeah. So preparing to migrate, refresh, and redesign as well. There's just a couple of different things that I really always like to highlight is establish time and resources. There's so many different ways, as I mentioned, to go about uh, uh, redesign. Um, and I know Christian's going to go through a couple more of them, but making sure that you're on the same page about that is incredibly important. Determining the scope of the redesign, as I mentioned, there's no one way to do it. Um, and then communicating the process, making sure that everyone knows these are the uh, the timelines, this is the budget, this is the goal, um, because it is a lot of work redesigning a website and nothing is worse. I've tried it myself of launching a new website, being really excited about it and getting a comment from someone internally in the organization who's like, well, you know what? I actually liked our old website much better. And it just breaks your heart as a marketer or as a website manager to hear that because it's just incredibly frustrating. And I know you guys have all put a lot of time into your website redesigns as I have. And um, it is a lot of work. It is a lot of prep work and it takes a lot of focus away from other important projects, but in the long run, it's incredibly important. It can have a massive impact on your organization. And I'm gonna pass it over to Christian to talk a little bit more in depth about those budget timelines and expectations. Yes, definitely. And I think we can actually just jump to the next one. Um, so yeah, there's kind of these three steps of budget timeline and expectations in general. So um, kind of some of the main budget components um, is like, of course, it's important to have those in place. Um, one of them you, you need to align is kind of the overall target. It's a very long process, as some of you probably know. Um, so there are some different factors that is important to figure out. Uh, one of them is to figure out, okay, how much of this redesign process do we want to do in-house and how much do we want to outsource to external it could be our agency or other like external stakeholders um the reason why that is important is of course that will affect the budget by by quite a, a large margin the more you can do in-house of course the cheaper it will be it costs some labor hours but the cheaper it will be in general um else items that can kind of affect the budget are listed listed here as well it could be the design what functionalities uh, should the new website have that is changing a lot as well i will um, yeah go a bit more into depth with that in a, in a few minutes um as most of you know there's also an accessibility legislation uh, i'm guessing that rings a bell with, uh, with a lot of you so it might be important to have this integrated as much as possible in the new design as well. Uh, we'll discuss that later on as well, but I know a lot of the redesign phases has actually started due to the accessibility legislation actually coming. So yeah, I'll discuss that later on. Um, timeline milestones. It is important to, to kind of spend some time on the timeline as well. Uh, the whole redesign process is overall a lengthy process. I know Jasmine mentioned two weeks. I think that's, that could be a record. Uh, at least that's a very, very short amount of process. 
uh, for, for the redesign process. So overall, it is a very lengthy um, general process. If you have done it, you're probably aware that deadlines can be pushed. That happens as with any other task, but especially with this, because you have many stakeholders involved and as it is a long process. Um, so it's important to be realistic when you're making the timeline. Um, I would suggest that you have some outside help from, could be from your agency to make sure that the timeline actually looks doable. Can be easy just to, to look at it by yourself and say, okay, that is possible. And then, yeah, every day happen. And then suddenly you are, yeah, uh, not doing as you actually hope for. Um, another important factor is that let's say it will take a year to, to make this redesign process. I think it's important to put that into small steps because if you just say, okay, from a year from now, it needs to look like this. I would probably put it into even weeks, but also like what, how should it be in, in a month? How should it be in a quarter? So you can actually follow the process and then you will also like in a timely manner, you will have an understanding whether the process will be pushed or whether we are actually uh, on target with the timeline. And then we get to, to the user testing part uh, before launching as well. Uh, does everything work as hoped? Do we need to make some final changes before the launch? Uh, classic example here is that we help through uh, the Mancito policy module. If some of you already have access to, uh, to Mancito, we can locate these classic lorem ipsum uh, template texts. Uh, could be a, a very classic example of someone just launching and suddenly we figure out, okay, there's actually a lorem ipsum text somewhere on the website. Um, could also be other randomized content that could be on the side from, from other templates. The next slide is in regards to kind of the expectation settings. It is very typical that our expectations from kind of before we have started the redesign and, and the planning to the actual process can be very different. Uh, therefore, I think it's very important to have realistic expectations to the process. That can be difficult if you're just doing it by yourself. So involve as many stakeholders as, as possible, both internally, but also externally. Um, an easy way to kind of measure them as well is with some of you might have worked with these like smart goals. Uh, so specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. So that can kind of be a way to ongoingly measure on these. Are we on target or do we need to do some, some like minor changes? I think the next one here is a quick pulse check. So um, I'll give you just one minute to answer this. Uh, the reason why we have them is just to, to get everyone involved as well. Um, so if you're done, I know some of you have had this web design uh, probably recently, at least that's what you asked, but um, did you execute it in-house or did you outsource some of the work? Or was it a mix of this, of course? So I'll give you just a minute to do this. And if any of you have any like fun stories, anecdotes, anything you, you would like to share, please do that in, in the comments as well. And I can share a little bit about what I've done in my redesigns. I've actually done the two big ones that I've done. They've all been in-house. Um, with very different sizes of teams, which I'm sure is the same for you guys. So the one that was two weeks, I think we were a team of six who worked on it. The process was we were meeting every single day and doing a little status on how far we were. Um, and the other time we were probably a team of 20 where we also had in-house developers even. So it can really, really vary. Um, I'll hand it over to Krishna and look at the results. <laughs> Good, yeah, I think, yeah, mix, that was probably what we expected as well. Um, so of course you go more into depth, how much of a mix and all those things, but I think it's just relevant to see, okay. And I would say for, for those of you who did it all in-house, kudos to you, that has uh, been probably a, a very, yeah, tough process. Uh, but yeah, in general, I think it's, it's very normal to, to have a mix and also have a help. I know a lot of you are working closely with your agency, so it is natural to, to have them involved in the process as well, or a tool like Monsito or, or something like that. So the five phases for um, or kind of the process for a website redesign. So the first phase and uh, the next slide is the website audit. So the website audit, is, audit is, is the phase that kind of lays the ground for the whole redesign. This is the phase where we kind of audit how our current website are performing and what is it actually that we are trying to improve on this redesign process. Um, and I think it's very easy to be overwhelmed with the process of redesign phase in general. Uh, therefore, it's very important, as mentioned, uh, to, to include as many as possible um, and also to ask for input, uh, both internally, but also externally. Um, this could, for example, be input on what features they're missing, like internal stakeholders. Are there any features you're missing in the current website at the moment? Is that something we, we have to look into to chatting on the web, new website? And again, also external um, stakeholders as well. It could also be if you are a municipality or something like that, you reach out to local citizens and actually ask, okay, how is the current website? 
Um, is there anything you're missing? So you actually know that the people who are using your website, is there anything we need to change in the redesign process? And next one, please. So research and discovery. So when looking at research and discovery, there's a few elements that needs to be reviewed. Uh, of course, your CMS system, important one. We get a lot of questions uh, on whether we can recommend any specific CMS systems. But again, um, we don't really want to do that. Again, there's many variables you need to, to kind of think about when choosing the CMS system. And each organization is completely different. So if we take a uh, municipality as an example, well, one municipality, maybe one CMS system works better for them. If you take another one, another one might, might work better for them. So I think it's, it's important to have an open mind when looking into different CMS systems, uh, testing them into different angles and, and figure out what, what works the best for you. Um, could also be like, there's a lot of open source CMSs out there, uh, maybe for a bank, like that's not relevant because there is something in regards to security and so on. So, so you need to be aware of, of a lot of factors. Um, but again, hopefully when you've done this redesign, you are stuck in, in the CMS system, at least for, for some time. So it is an important factor to actually make sure you make the right decision um, yeah, at first. The visual design is evolving a lot. Uh, looking at websites developed five years ago, even a year ago, two years ago, like a lot is going on and a lot is happening in, in the design phase and what, what is actually a possibility, but also what, is, what are people looking into and what are they requesting that your website can actually do. So, so that is an important one. Do we need to have videos included? Do we need to have a search bar? Is there specific call to action buttons that we need to have on the website? So all those, of course, that's just you know, a few examples. I think the list can be very long, but, but have a think about that in, uh, in general. The next one, the content part is, is a very important one. We rarely see anyone who, who kind of does a redesign completely from scratch. Um, so often you would take some of the old content with you to the next, um, to the redesign or to the next website as well. So, so put some time to, or take some time out to figure out what content that needs to be transferred. Um, there's different tools for this. For example, in our like Monsito policy module, you can actually locate old content. It can be old, um, PDF files or uh, old HTML sources that haven't had any visitors over the last year or two years. Uh, maybe both in regards to performance, we don't want to transfer that, uh, but also in regards to your SEO, that affects that. Um, and the final part, accessibility-wise, um, especially on PDFs, that's that's a tough tough nut. Um, so if you have a lot of PDFs, well, if if a lot of them haven't really been been read over the last year, well, should we then have them transferred to the next website or should we actually just remove them? The SEO part is also important to have in mind uh, when creating a new website. Um, you might as well make it SEO optimized in the creation of the website instead of actually doing it afterwards. Um, I think it's there is some like quick wins when you're redesigning and, and have a think about it because SEO is evolving a lot. So you might as well have it like think about it when you create it. So when you actually launch it, you are, um, yeah, the algorithm in, in general that scans for SEO will give you a lot of uh, plus points of what to say in regards to that. The competitive analysis, it's, it's kind of always interesting to see how others in your industry have set up their website. Uh, they might have some fancy features that you had no idea was actually possible, uh, but that would make sense in your, uh, your new redesign as well. So, so have a look on your competitors websites um, to see, okay, how are they actually set up? Is there anything we can learn from them as well? Web accessibility. So yeah, important factor as well. And uh, yeah, uh, the reasoning for, for the smiling as well. I know like there's, if you, some of you, I'm guessing you have, have worked with web accessibility. It's a long process. And I think a lot of the redesign phases have also started with an old website that wasn't accessible, suddenly for some of you, maybe the legislation came and you were like, okay, I can't fix it on 10 or 20,000 pages. So we might actually make it, it may, might be easier for us to look into a redesign phase. Um, in my opinion, it's one of the most important factors uh, in general and, and also when looking into to a redesign phase. Due to many factors, of course, the, the, the overall inclusion, uh, around a fifth of the, of the global citizens have some kind of uh, reading disorder or an, an issue or accessibility issue in general. So it is relevant to have everyone included. Um, it is also affecting your SEO performance score as well. Um, it is like that is evolving as well, but, but here now it's included in the SEO score um, and also the overall performance of the website. So have a think about accessibility and make sure you actually like 
yeah, uh, fix those um, low hanging fruits in the beginning as well. The mobile friendly design, um, yeah, as more and more of you know, uh, when you're looking in your analytics module, you probably see that there's an increased uh, visitor rate from mobiles, tablets, and so on. So I think it's important to look into that as well. How is the website actually looking from a mobile device, from a tablet? Is it looking as, as we hope for? Are our articles, are they too long for, um, it might look well on a desktop, but then you go on a, on a smartphone where the screen is smaller. Are they too long? Do we need to change anything there as well? Website speed, another important one. Um, not only it affects the user friendliness, but again, also affects your SEO. If you have a slow website that will uh, affect your SEO score, that will affect your ranking in uh, the different in Google and other, um, and other places on the website as well. So have a think about that in, in this design as well. And that goes a bit back to what content would we want to transfer. The bigger the website, uh, the more complex uh, of like PDFs, the larger our pictures, like all those things affect the website speed. So yeah, have a think about that. Maybe you should set up a policy uh, on images greater than one megabyte. We need to figure out where those, could we uh, kind of remove them or do we need to do anything with them? Final part, security, of course, it needs to be in place, uh, but uh, yeah, won't go too much into that, but, uh, but of course that needs to be in, in place. So the next one to phase two, budgeting and redesign strategy. So phase two is much about aligning goals for the website with different stakeholders as discussed as well a bit early on, both by me, but also mentioned by, by Jasmine. Um, I think secondly, it's, it's important to kind of set a realistic budget and timeline as stressed previously. Um, these should of course reflect your internal resources. How much time do we have internally? Do we have the resources to, uh, or the budget to outsource a lot externally or like how is the mixture? So, so have a think about that as well and be realistic. I think that's very important. So you don't um, six months out the, the, down the road, you figure out, okay, we actually need more budget for this because we need to have some external help. The final part in um, is of course the redesign like strategy. How much do you want to do in-house and how much do you want to outsource? So um, yeah, in general, have a think about that. Um, Next one, um, so an example of, of kind of a strategy and reasoning for the redesign could, as mentioned before, be due to accessibility, not only to increase the user friendliness, but as mentioned also to kind of include your full potential target group and also include or increase your SEO ranking. If you have done this like accessible, uh, like going in, making a website accessible, that it takes time. It's not something that you do from, uh, from one day to the other. So. Yeah, I will uh, I'll mention that a few times where we've done it, but uh, have specifically a think about this to include everyone as well in the process. The phase three execution of website redesign. Often when creating the website, you are kind of creating a mock-up of, uh, of pages to kind of see, okay, how is the potential? What will the design be? Um, and then thereafter, you will send it to development to actually create the, the specific website. So I think that's it's, it's also important to have a look and have a think about how do we want, what is, what is kind of our internal branding? How do we want our visitors to actually see us as a company or as a public organization? Um, could be also something about optimizing your information architecture and make sure the hierarchy is as it should be within the, the design of the uh, website. Both it can affect the SEO, but also kind of the, the tapping structure, like accessibility wise, when going through the website, is it act as we actually hope, or do we need to make some changes there as well? And uh, no, Jasmine, you may have done some of those as well. Maybe you can share a bit of your experience within, uh, within that. Yeah, no, I think definitely when you get into the execution of the website redesign, I think it's super important to, that you're doing those wireframes, that you're getting the design, you're getting the buy-in, um, that there's everything from the look and feel and the graphics and the content and that you're showing that to all of your stakeholders. Because what I was telling Christian before when we were talking about this is one of the most frustrating things is if you don't show the designs to all of the internal stakeholders and then have it developed, it's way more difficult for the developers than to then have to go back and change and adjust things. So really for your execution part, make sure you really got buy-in on all of the design the content beforehand. Um, it'll save you a lot of time instead of going back and forth, just getting it done once and then going. And that's very much the same principle that we work with today on our website. We work with our designer, make sure that we have everything in place and then send it to uh, our developer. And I think it's just good practice in general because the longer time you have a website, 
just like anything, the longer time you have a house, the more stuff you're going to fill into the house. It's the same with a website. The longer time you have a website, the more PDFs are going to be on it, the more pages are going to be on it. And your website redesign is kind of like the spring cleaning of your house. You're getting rid of everything you don't need. Um, you're painting where it needs a little bit of extra paint, hammering those in extra nails on there to make sure that SEO is top notch. Um, so the execution phase is incredibly important. That's really what's going to make or break your, your success of the website redesign. Because otherwise, if you're not doing all these things, people are once again going to find all those issues and uh, improvements that originally sparked um, the website. Same goes for content, uh, be, really being critical about what's being migrated over. I know some sometimes if you do decide to uh, work with an external agency, it's really about making sure that they're critical about the content that's being moved over as well and not just blindly doing it. So, all right, back to you. Perfect. So on the next slide, yeah, I know there were some questions prior to um, to this uh, this webinar as well in regards to like how would we or recommend to kind of incorporate accessibility in the redesign process. I've mentioned a little bit, um, but I think it, it's very important to has, have as many as possible included in both internally, but also externally, but, but especially internally um, in regards to this process. Um, I think, like we have in our, um, we have a Monsito Accessibility Help Center as well to kind of explain, okay, what is actually the rationale behind this check, for example? Because the first thing we heard when the accessibility legislation came, uh, there were maybe some editors around uh, both in Denmark and uh, across Europe that said, okay, I've never heard it, it was an issue. Um, well, maybe they couldn't get to a contact button on your website. Maybe they couldn't read the website at all. Um, so that is kind of why we're trying to, to explain the rationale behind every check in the accessibility legislation. Why is it actually that it, it is there? Um, so I think that is, that is important, not that you have to go that, through that. Uh, I think people probably hate you for that if you go through the whole legislation one by one. But the idea behind it is to explain the rationale behind it, give some facts in regards to, okay, actually 20% uh, has some kind of reading disorder or have has an accessibility issue so therefore it's actually important um also one way to get around it is to maybe host some short workshops i know we have helped a lot uh, with different of our um, organizations that we work with to to host those workshops or give some examples give some information so actually internally like there will be some kind of increased focus or or happiness to actually run this project and make the website accessible if you just run it by yourself, that will be completely important. And also because then when you launch everything, like maybe they would, like they will just forget about accessible website. And then in two years time, you just have a website that's not accessible anymore. So then it will be completely waste of time or at least to some extent. Um, so yeah, have internal stakeholders, but also external stakeholders. Secondly, it's also um, like important that you not only make a redesign with an accessible website, but also make sure that people are educated going forward, as I just mentioned. There's different ways of doing that, um, but I think it's very important to make sure that you are not just making a redesign, making sure that everything is, is, is like set in place, everything is launched, everything looks fine. And then from there, so not might be some changes in, um, in editors and suddenly like the website is not accessible anymore. Then you have a, a massive sunk cost if you've just paid on a new redesign process. And then maybe in two years time, you have to think about this again. So make sure that not only in the redesign process, it is in place, but also kind of in the like educational part afterwards. Phase four, testing and launching. So testing and launching is kind of the exciting part that you have worked so hard for over the last, well, maybe two weeks or maybe a year or two years or whatever. Um, so therefore it's also important that you do not neglect this step and just want to launch because now, okay, we've worked so hard, we just want to launch and okay, it's out there. Um, so a pre-launch pre audit is important in making sure that you actually find some template issues, as mentioned earlier, Lorem Ipsum issues, for example, and other kind of related performance issues. I re recommend that you kind of create a checklist when doing this uh, to make sure that you have all relevant aspects, aspects sorry, tested in, in these features as well. Um, so the user testing part should include multiple stakeholders as well, uh, could potentially both be internally and externally, as I mentioned earlier. Have someone from uh, like living in the municipality, for example, if you are uh, working as or working within a municipality, have someone externally like actually going through that, uh, being a part of the process. I'm guessing someone will actually love that and be part of the process as well. Um, and it also gives you a different angle to okay, 
do we need to make some changes? It is very easy to uh, to just be in your own bubble when developing and redesigning. So I think it's it's very important to have this external um, yeah help as well. Um, the user testing as well uh, should include, I would say, and both a team like internally, but also from maybe from different departments as well. IT have have different things on our website. Um, sorry, my series starting here. Okay, jeg fandt dette på nettet om IT Hæver Foreningen Rosen website. Very sorry about that. It has some, I don't know, why it suddenly starts. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, um, when you have kind of created a lot of content in this in this redesign process, it's very easy to miss some of the potential issues. So therefore, make sure that you have enough internal and external people to, to test it. Um, even like just random testing, but also using assistive technology it could be you just tapping through the website. Is, is that actually possible or do we need to make some changes? If you can find someone who, uh, who has a reading disorder, for example, well, make them test the website out. So you actually make sure that when you launch it, everything is set in place, everything is working. You don't have to make changes afterwards. And the next one we have created just a few like checklist essentials. Of course, this can be way longer. I don't want to go through the whole checklist, but just some essentials. First one, ensure that all like call, call to action buttons have links assigned to them. Um, the next one, all pages have optimized title tags and meta descriptions. All images should also either have an alt text uh, or if they are decor decorative, sorry for that, um, they need an all like alt text as well added to them. So make sure you actually have that in place um, prior to, to the launch as well. Test the website navigation as mentioned by tapping through the website and update URLs on the new website as well to make sure they are aligned. Phase five, so go live with the redesign as well. Finally, we're kind of at the launching stage. I think this is the most important one as well. At least that's the, the most happy one, uh, especially. So we've talked a lot about the steps kind of before launching, but the after launch as well is also very important uh, and also something that you should actually plan and not just launch and then, okay, happy days. This is where you make sure that your kind of return on investments come into place. Uh, important items could be to monitor like post-launch traffic. Are they as we, we expected? Uh, if not, okay, what is happening? Is there some issue somewhere that we are not aware of that we need to look into? Um, do we have a strategy on how we analyze on the visitors, how they interact with the website? If you already use Monsito, you can track that in, in the analytics, but also the heat maps, how are people integrating with the website? Um, is it again, as, as we hoped, do we need to do some final changes maybe? Um, secondly, of course, we want to make sure that all these like basic things are working, that links are working, accessibility is in place, SEO have been optimized, all templates, Lorem Ipsum text, all those things have been removed. And the final part is to make sure that you kind of have an ongoing auditing tool. Could be Monsito, um, of course, um, but, but having that into place as well to make sure that that like massive investment, both in regards to like budget, but also like time spent on it, um, will not just be a sunk cost, with, uh, sunk cost within a short period of time that you can actually make sure that you keep up the redesign process and make sure the quality is as, uh, as it was when you launched. So I think I'll hand it over to Jasmine from here. Yeah, thanks Christian for going through all those five different phases of a website redesign. There's sure a lot to think about. And I'm just gonna summarize out of all of those different phases, what some of the best practices that I've experienced are important to consider. And the first one actually goes really much hand in hand with you in the post-launch phase. And it's really thinking about mixing. Yes, you're mixing whether or not you're doing things in-house and um, working with an external uh, provider to help you, but also mixing manual processes and automation. So um, speaking of the post-launch process, one of my first jobs as a marketing intern um, the company was actually undergoing a website redesign. And one of my jobs was going through and clicking every single link on a page. That is a waste of time and resources nowadays because there are so many tools out there that can just automatically check your website for broken links. So really being smart and strategic on where can I automate things? Um, where can I reuse things from other pieces of marketing collateral? And then investing your time where it really needs to be in terms of uh, analysis of traffic and setting up a new structure or investing in um, the design and templates, especially 
for pages when you have some, several similar pages, setting up a really smart template makes it that much easier. So if you decide that in-house, then it's much easier for an external provider to help you kind of quickly replicate that with content and images if you have a good structure that you want. Um, and like I said, I just put a little note here at the bottom. Let's just say nobody likes a brand new website with broken links and content compliance and accessibility issues. So making sure that you're really doing that quality check of your website before. Um, yes, you can do it with having user testing, but also just making sure that you're doing that automated check um, for uh, just as the best practice is really nice because I know on a daily basis, I really don't like when I get an email from someone saying, hey, did you see this broken link or incorrect link on a page? It's incredibly frustrating. And it's even more frustrating if you're just launching a brand new website. So really just do yourself a favor and do that due diligence uh, and prioritize where automation can help you. Because yes, sometimes it's a little bit of a dirty word in marketing, oh, automation, but there's a lot of things that it can help us achieve so much more when we're incorporating it correctly. All right, if we hop to the next slide. Oh, I think we have to, didn't we? There we go. So I think I talked a little bit about this as well, but um, when you are redesigning your website, it often impacts a lot of other things. So one of the other things that I always really encourage people to think about when they're doing a website redesign is something as simple as file structure. So maybe you're hosting all of your images and your documents on your website in your CMS. Maybe you're hosting it elsewhere in SharePoint and integrating to your website make sure you have a proper naming structure for all of your digital assets. It makes it that much easier um, for you to just keep track of everything. Um, I've done a lot of different re renaming all the files, but it makes it that much easier that if you make an update and the PDF that's on your website needs to be accessible, then you can very quickly locate that inaccessible file and re-upload it as well. Um, like I said, don't just blindly migrate content over as well. Make sure you're really thinking about that. And then the other thing is also make sure that you're not migrating things that have an old look and feel. I know this is often a really big mistake that happens is that you have a brand new look and or the reason you do a redesign is because you have a new brand, but then you forget that all the PDFs you need uploaded on your website also need that new brand look and feel. And so it creates this really weird mismatch where you have a beautiful new website, but PDFs that look like they're from 10 years ago. Awesome. Then collaboration, accountability, and transparency. Um, like Christian mentioned, I've done I've done websites in two weeks and and also um, in a year. Make sure you're on the same page. That's the most important thing. Whether you're doing it, the website redesign in a short amount of time. We had daily standups where we actually met twice a day. Once in the morning, what are we getting done by two o'clock? And then once again at two o'clock, okay, what are our priorities for tomorrow um, or the rest of the day tomorrow? And what do we need to get to? Uh, if you're project is longer, maybe it's a weekly or bi-weekly meeting, um, but it's really important that you're constantly checking in with the other people who are involved in the project. Um, tracking improvements as well. To be successful, you need to know where you're coming from. So having an initial audit, for example, let's say the whole reason that you want to improve your SEO, you need to have some kind of measurable metric of saying, hey, we were only ranking on page two of Google. Our goal with a new redesign is to rank on the first page. Setting those really sharp and specific uh, measurements is incredibly important, not only for yourself, but for creating accountability in your organization, but also being transparent to other stakeholders that there is a reason you're doing this website redesign because there's a benefit for your organization. All right, and if we hop to the next one, audit and, and test in your staging environment. Like I mentioned, I did the manual broken link checks once upon a time. Um, please, please, please do this. It is incredibly frustrating um, when you have a brand new website um, that you have things that are not working. That's the whole reason that you went away from it. There are so many tools out there um, that can help you check, have your family members involve your community, whatever it may be, just make sure that you include it. Um, I know one of the things we've always done at the organizations I've worked is we've done that we've opened it up to everyone in or the organization one week prior to the live launch. And that's often like Christian said, maybe IT has a different perspective. They think about different things or another department will um, have another point of view. So that's really one of the best ways to do it because these are people who know your brand, they know your 
organization. They know your values and they can really help you quickly pinpoint what could be potential problems for them in engaging with your community or your customers. And I think this is my, my last tip is post-launch maintenance is incredibly important. Um, after I have done website redesigns, one of the most important things that I've invested in as a marketer is educating everyone who's a content contributor on our website. Yes, as the marketing or web teams, we often own the website, but we're often not the only ones uploading content on the website. So one of the things that I've always worked with is if we're opening up our website to new content contributors, we need to teach them how to do things properly. We need to not only educate them on how to use our CMS, but we need to educate them on accessibility and how to upload an image and add alt text or uh, educate them on why website performance is important and that they can't upload giant files to our website. So one thing that I always did was I hosted on a quarterly basis. If there was someone new who wanted to become a content contributor to our website, I did a little mini course for them. Uh, I know a lot of other people that I've talked to in other organizations, they do a similar thing. They even do like maybe once quarterly meetup of sharing tips and tricks. Um, and this is especially important if you have a large website. If you're, for example, a university and you have many different departments, there's no way that you as the webmaster can be held accountable for uploading content everywhere. And you're going to become a bottleneck if you're the one who needs to do all of that work. So educating, educating, and educating people is incredibly important. And along with that is establishing website guidelines. Um, walking people through what the expectations are in terms of, hey, we're trying to achieve WCAG 2.1 AA compliance, and this is what is expected of you. And it's okay to be strict. I've been known as the brand police before <laughs> at different organizations, and I'm okay with that. And it's because I want our web, I've wanted our website to have a high standard. And then last but not least, um, weekly scans or any other kind of weekly tool that can kind of help you detect errors is always super helpful because if you have a large website, even if you don't have a large website, it can be very difficult to have an overview of everything that's going on, especially because for some of you, your website is your full-time job if you're a webmaster or website manager, um, but you're still busy doing other things and maintaining relationships with stakeholders or educating them. So everything that goes on is impossible to know. And if you're a website or a marketing manager, you probably also have other campaigns to run. Yes, your website is your main funnel or uh, portal, but you've got other things that are connected to it that you got to work on too. So any help you can get um, and leveraging that automation is incredibly important. Awesome. And I'll uh, hand it over to Graziella. Yeah, so so you learn what you should do or what you're going to do. And now it's a part of like um what we can help what we can do from our side to help you out. If you're already having like okay, sitting down with a website redesign and you need to make an audit, we can do an audit of your of your website by running a, a scan of your website, finding how many of broken links you have. Also, you can do it um on your before you launch so you make sure that your launch is a success another thing we can do is show you what other things besides a website scan on certain broken links we can we can do in Lucido uh, in terms of accessibility in terms of uh, performance overall um, and maybe uh, you're curious to see how your user interaction is so we can show you our heat maps feature where we can um, track user uh, interaction on your website. So you'll be able to understand of, okay, maybe I should improve my flow over here. Uh, people are not even scrolling down to the bottom of my page. Why do I need such a long page? Uh, maybe I can shorten it um, halfly. So I will leave that open and we can go to uh, the quickly to the resources that they will be shared together with the slides for all of you who will um, attend here and also for all registered. But we have like, um, quite useful resources that they can help you along or maybe can validate what you're already doing that you're on the right track. In terms of, uh, we have a playbook and a checklist that are very, very useful um, um, PDFs, accessible PDFs. Um, and then we have a blog post that we try to put those simple SEO website redesign tips that can um, set you for, okay, I went through those checks. I should I sh uh, ensure at least that I uh, did an audit and a validation of my SEO. We have the accessibility handbook and of course the quick check report, which runs like a very small 
um, piece of your website um, states. And uh, let's jump into q and I know that we have pre-submitted questions before the webinar, so I'm curious to um, know if anybody else, I could not see here in the chat in the Q&A, but maybe the pre-submitted, you're having them, Jasmine? Yeah, I can uh, take a look at them. And one of the questions that we got was um, how to take accessibility into account. I think we've talked very much about that at length. So I'm going to skip over that. But if you do have more questions to, that are more specific, do feel free to reach out. I don't want you to feel like you're we're missing you. Yeah. Um, but the end, add, oh, you want to add something, Christian? Just a little thing as well that uh, yeah. came into mind. I, we, we talked a lot about accessibility in general, and now like you have the WCAG 2.1, that's kind of the, the state of accessibility at the moment. There is soon to be a 2.2 as well, so you that's might true. have that into mind. We have, if you're using Monsieur, we have that in a, in a draft version. It's not publicly yet, so therefore it's in draft. They keep on pushing the date. Um, but have that into mind as well, because that will be the one that you probably need to follow at some point soon. So not just looking at the WCAG 2.1, but actually looking ahead and looking into the 2.2. So the yeah. 2.2 will be the 2.1, but, but with additional checks. Yeah, that's uh, a really, yes, really good point. Jesper has a question over here around accessibility on uh, content forms. I, I believe like uh, we have discussed that already with Lars, and it is it will be something that we'll discuss probably on your on our life as I posted, but accessibility on forums, make sure that you are uh, tagging in each uh, field, which uh, what the field is about. Mm -hmm. And if it's a mandatory field, definitely describe what is about. Uh, you can do a quick check with um, uh, either accessibility expert, or you can with a screen reader, or you can do the tap on your, um, uh, instead of using the mouse, you can use the tap go through your form and find out if if it actually um, uh, reads the field uh, of the of each um, of, of each field if there is a name for it and if that name is visible another tip for people who are uh, colorblind make sure that you have a color contrast uh, that is making them understand which field is mandatory and which not but i i think we are recommending and what is recommended in the accessibility guidelines is to write a star and mm -hmm. and uh, describe that it's a mandatory field yeah that's a really good point graziela having those icons is also super important for um, accessibility on forms some of the other questions we also have, I just want to make sure we have enough time to address them. One of them is how to get stakeholder buy-in uh, for a website redesign when there's a lot of change fatigue. I think for my personal point of view, um, putting together a business case focused on, like I mentioned at the beginning, what is not working on your website right now um, and highlighting those different things. So maybe it is the user experience, but having um, maybe videos, having a screen capture of your website and showing how the user experience is not working, either from your own personal point of view, but even going out and interviewing, like Christian said, if you are a municipality, go out and interview and film your residents using your website, find out what they think is confusing, ask them how to do a specific task on your website. Um, the same thing can be if you're a B2C or B, B2B, if you're um, ask your consumers uh, and track that because also what you'll be able to see is data, right? That's the really nice thing with websites and digital marketing is you're actually really able to track everything. So being able to say, hey, well, we really want our website to do this action, um, seeing how many people in the user journey are dropping off through your analytics is a great way to kind of put together the case. Of course, change fatigue, it is a really big change for your website redesign. I think breaking it into different phases like Christian did makes it a little bit more uh, manageable. Also having um, the proper or having a lot of tools and investing in automation where that can support you might also help a little bit with the change fatigue because there will always be change. And I think websites are one of the things that are changed out the most. I think it's every two to three years on average that websites are changed out um, and it's necessary to stay competitive. Um, but putting a business case together around what's not working for you is typically what will help people convince people, even though it might not be their top priority at this time. Christian, I don't know if you have anything else to add from your experience in talking with um, some people. 
Yeah, and as you mentioned a little bit, I think it's very important because again, it can be a very long process. And if you just say, come and say, okay, I, we need to make a website redesign. And if some in your team have, have done that before, they will be, oh, not again, or yeah, that'll be a long, but like you, you want to kind of make sure that everyone is involved. I think it's very, it, it is very important to put it into very small pieces of, of like small targets. What do we need to achieve within a week or a month? Like instead of looking into three months or six months, those are important, but put them out there. Don't look at them too often. Look in, into guard, like in regards to these small goals. Um, mentioned it a little bit as well early on, but, but have, have, your, have someone from the outside, your agency or someone else to actually look at the plan you've put together. Is it realistic? Because if you put it together yourself and it is not realistic, well, then you can spend some time and then you keep on heading your head against the wall because you don't really achieve the goals that you, you've set. So have someone from the outside as well to actually look at the plan, someone who knows about it, of course, um, and see, okay, yeah, it is realistic or it is not. You, make to, you need to make some, some changes here. Awesome. And the next question that we have as well, and actually the last one, but I think it plays in really nicely to what we've been talking about is what are best practices to gather content or text in a complex multi-divisional organization during a website redesign? This is where, for me at least, and the success I've had is templatizing the pages. So if you know that you have 10 different products and there's 10 different product managers and stakeholders for each of those pages, or let's say you're a university and it's 10 different departments or a school district and it's 10 different schools, creating a template is an incredibly important way uh, for you to be able to leverage those best practices when it comes to um, page structure and design, uh, SEO, but also accessibility and saying, okay, this is what the page looks like, or this is what the the your five pages look like. This is how much content you can have here. And this is uh, the type of content you should have here. Give me a description and try to fit it into that. Same with images. This is where you put this type of image. This is where the feature list lives. This is where PDFs lives. Oh, and by the way, those PDFs need to be accessible because they're online content. So really working within the like frameworks of you as the website manager or website expert are helping to guide the different people in your big multi-divisional organization, but at the same time, they know their content and text best. So you're leveraging them and helping to put it into a web-friendly format that's going to bring you guys as an organization the most success going forward. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, Christian. No, I think that was spot on. I think we are good ahead over time um, a little bit. So thank you all for joining us. Have a lovely afternoon. I hope that you have learned a little bit more and you become a little bit more clever on the website redesign process and see you on our next webinar. Bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You.